Good evening, everybody, and welcome to this last year's uh, EL webinar, the special edition. Um, uh, it, will, it will be moderated by uh, EL's interim president, Dr. Hahal Kentel. Before starting, uh, we'd like to thank uh, again our sponsor, Kedua Richter. And uh, there's a small video that uh, we'll play for that. What does it take to make a medicine? You need to shift your perspective to see success comes from a series of innovations. Without the dedicated work of our highly trained researchers, no such progress would be possible. It is today that experts need to think about the diseases of tomorrow, and premium quality requires the latest technology. All these aspects come together to create new treatments that will improve the health of millions. This is what we work for every day. Gideon Richter, health is our mission. Yeah, um, good evening, everybody. Um, <clears throat> welcome to our special edition, um, the last webinar this of this year session of the EL webinar series. Um, this is a special edition in cooperation with a female project. And um, today we are going to talk about uh, this project <clears throat> and about the idea behind it. Uh, we have uh, three guests today, um, and uh, I would like to present um, everybody um, the bird's eye view of the project will be presented by Ulrich Bakirk. He's uh, the coordinator of the project, and I think Ulrich, you are going to present what the project is about and what was the development and how it's ongoing and what is the idea of, um, you know, of the future with this project. Uh, you are MA and a PhD fellow at uh, Aarhus University um, and uh, you are <clears throat> working in the Danish healthcare sector for more than 10 years. So this, this is a new perspective for us, I guess, uh, what you're going to present to us. Thank you very much for being here tonight. That's really great. Um, then Attila Boko <clears throat> will talk about the Lucy app, uh, which is an application uh, in the diagnosis profiling of um, patients with possible endometriosis. Uh, Attila Boko <clears throat> is a board member of the EL, and I think therefore I, there's no big need to present you, Attila. Uh, you are head of the gynecology surgery unit in Semmelweis University in Budapest, which I had the pleasure to visit some weeks ago during our masterclass experience there, which was really great. Thank you so much for the brilliant organization of this very successful event with, I think, more than 20 participants. And um, uh, Professor Boko is involved in, uh, um, um, yeah, all the details about um, endometriosis surgery, I would say, and very specialized in bowel endometriosis and ICG use and new techniques, um, as you all know. Um, and then last but not least, uh, Nicolas Bourdel from, from Fran France, from uh, Clermont-Ferrand is joining us tonight. Um, welcome. And he's going to talk about machine learning for surgery and uh, Nicolai, you're going to present um, yeah, the surgeon's view of the project, I would say. And uh, I learned some details about this surgeon's view of the project and the future of augmented reality during laparoscopic surgery in Budapest too. That was very impressive. So I'm very happy that you're going to present this tonight. Um, you are full professor <clears throat> at uh, Clermont-Ferrand, but um, as you told me, uh, now you are also CEO uh, of uh, Sugar, which is uh, kind of part of the project. And um, yeah, this is a really great vision that you have. And um, I'm very interested to see uh, what you're going to present tonight. So I think we just should start. We are going to listen to the three presentations uh, and uh, discuss all the questions at the end. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. And uh, Ulrich, let's start. 
Thank you very much, Hal, and thank you very much for the kind invitation. Uh, great to see so many of you. And uh, yeah, if you're not able to participate tonight, you can always watch the webinar recorded. Um, I'll just share my slides here. Is this look, looking all right to you all? Yes, it's fine. Good, Good thanks. Um, so I'm going to introduce us to this female project. Female is an acronym for finding endometriosis using machine learning. Um, so it's about um, personalized early risk prediction, prevention and intervention based on AI and big data technologies. And I'll just yeah, introduce the project and then uh, to and Nicola will later on go into details uh, with some specific parts. Um, so the context for this project was uh, this field of science, AI, machine learning, under this program about individual awareness and empowerment for self-management of health. And um, I could use all my time here to you go tell the story behind the project, but you'll have to uh, join us, I hope, uh, at some future event to, to get that full story. Um, but just it's important to keep in mind here that the topic is, is actually a, a, a tech project. Um, and then I uh, was uh, really uh, heavily introduced to this project by a medical anthropologist here in the uh, research unit for general practice in Aarhus. Um, and she really paid my attention to endometriosis and, and this huge diagnostic delay. Um, and at that time, I, I, I read some interesting white papers about can we use uh, advanced computer scientists to uh, detect um, specific uh, individuals, for example, and this was actually quite relevant for the case of endometriosis. So we began to put this puzzle together um, and really to make it uh, an interdisciplinary project from the very beginning and also international, of course. So this thing about digital footprints and machine learning is basically about can we identify patients with a given disease and then analyze their digital footprints? Can we then develop an algorithm to identify unique patterns? And can we then find and target patients in the wider population? So that is basically the, the main idea with, with, with the thinking behind this project. Um, this goes uh, for um, wearables and, and smartphones and all that, but it also goes on a population level. Um, and this is a, a visual uh, that Precision Life provided, uh, one of the partners in the project. So how do we then trend, uh, move and, uh, and change from a population health perspective into this more personalized um, and the term is nowadays precision medicine approach. So that's really what we're trying to do here. How, how can we convert multi-omics data sets into personalized medicine? So that's what we're trying to do um, in the female project. And the main aim of, aim of the project, like you read before, is to personalize this early risk prediction of endometriosis with a name to ensure individualized intervention, and then to build knowledge for prognostic prevention by the identification of subtypes of endometriosis. That's really what we're trying to achieve with this project. And the ambition is to then develop this platform where it's able to convert these multi-omic data sets into this personalized predictive model. And that's what we're trying to achieve here over the next four years. We're already well on the way. Attila and Nicolai will tell more about this soon, but that's the ambition. And I'm happy to see uh, Luna Hummelto here tonight because uh, she really inspired us um, to, uh, to uh, develop this um, uh, model, a framework of the project. Um, and, and basically this platform uh, should then, um, well, both like, rely on data sets from these various contexts, but also feed back uh, uh, data into, into tools uh, at, at multi levels. So we have, for example, the patient level uh, where it's very, very important that we have uh, the women in pain seeking help um, and how may we then guide um, that help seeking behavior. So what that we're trying to, Attila will explain more about the Lucy application, we try to apply this um, smartphone healthcare app uh, to assist with that. But we're also improving detection and diagnosis at, at the clinician level. And that goes both for the GP, where we try in one of the work packages to convert um, biological data 
into a clinical decision support tool. And also at the more specialized level to guide uh, the gynecologist uh, to include subtypes of endometriosis. Um, and ultimately, uh, Nicola will explain about this um, if we look into the, the, the treatment level, so to say. Um, we wish to uh, uh, train this algorithm and apply this uh, vision based tool to uh, assist the, the surgeon um, while, while um, uh, life uh, surgeries. Um, and, and also a part of the treatment regime in the project is to identify if a digitalized uh, mindfulness intervention is actually both uh, uh, efficient and uh, effective. So uh, that's just like the framework for the project. So we, we, we really intend to improve quality of life in women with endometriosis. And we try to do this by enabling shared decision-making in both primary and secondary care sectors as part of this personalized pathway. And we really try to go out there and make some noise to raise awareness, to increase literacy and to empower women. And I'll come back to that a little bit later. So the female project uh, is a project uh, over four years um, in this it's 2020 um, frame. And uh, the EU decided to contribute with almost 6 million euros. So we're really thankful for that. And uh, this word cloud here was actually from our kickoff meeting last uh, or uh, this February. And uh, the, the main words um, that we could highlight is that if we should succeed with the female project, we need to have a lot of collaboration, especially since it's so interdisciplinary, but we also need to have a high level of enthusiasm because it's a really novel work. It's really state of the art. So we don't know if we'll succeed with everything, but as long as we try to keep up high hopes and high quality, I'm sure we can make it and pulled something off at least. Um, so we have 17 European partners uh, across academia, across uh, you know, university hospitals, across civil society organizations, patient associations. I see also some of the representatives here today. Really happy to, to see you. Um, and uh, it's a really nice group uh, also spread across Europe. Uh, so we have a strong team from Scandinavia and Eastern Europe, but also on the British Islands and Central Europe and actually also in Turkey. So yeah, we are really spread across Europe. Um, and I think it's, it's also this diversity in the partners that is, is part of our success. So female project is basically about um, the core of research and innovation. And I've learned that, you know, when you apply in technology to improve women's health, you can call that female technology or femtech. So the core here is basically endometriosis research and femtech. And we have a work package dedicated to uh, exploring the, the, the phenotype and social economic consequences of endometriosis. And we are using Danish and, and Scottish health registered data to um, learn more about this, to be updated about this. We have another work package looking into biological subtypes, uh, trying to combine uh, the risk score of single genes into a combinatory risk score. And ultimately to, like I mentioned before, translate that insight into clinical decision-making tools targeting general practitioners. So can we stratify patients in a high and a low risk group? That is the ambition. Then we have a work package about big data. This is where Attila will tell much more what's going on, um, where we try to uh, de develop this uh, Lucy application together and utilize that as a research tool as well. So we can collect data through the application and feed something back to the users. Then Nicola will, I guess, go through six and seven about uh, collecting videos and training this AR tool. Um, I can tell you much more about that. And then we have a work package about this digital mindfulness intervention where we're in a randomized control trial, we're trying to see 
uh, if that's effective. It has proven effective in other contexts, so we hope it will in endometriosis too. So that's like the core in the project, but embedded in a framework about how do we measure to the impact throughout the whole project and how, what can we do basically to realize earlier value creation. So we have a strong focus about that and also to make the research and innovation responsible. So how do we maintain high level of equity and ethics while conducting our research? And then to make it professional and to communicate about it, we have work packages around this um, to maintain high level of uh, quality, uh, quality project management and also to secure both internal and, and external communication. And we're doing a really nice job there. I think we are before Christmas going to have at least 150,000 uh, views, exposures, interactions with our social media posting so far. So that's really good. And that's purely uh, generated through um, organic um, activities. So we haven't paid a cent to do so. Um, so just here, a few uh, photos from the work package meetings. Um, Loan is with us today. So yeah, she went to this meeting in the UK um, earlier in September and, and she had this, this tweet. Um, so yeah, it's, it's about the prevalence again, you know, the, the geographic distribution, uh, the, the socio um, uh, the economic consequences. Uh, this is from work package four. Uh, we have Oxford on board. Uh, we have uh, Alba University now on board. Um, great, great group of people here, really promising. Um, here's a, just a short glimpse of the Lucy application in the uh, App Store and the, the Google Marketplace to see how it looks. Um, also a really nice group of people together. Uh, we have here a Nicolas setting with the, the more tech-based partners and uh, technical universities, uh, those really skilled in machine learning uh, and AI um, algorithm uh, development. Um, this is from the communication web package where we discuss how to communicate about the project and, and reach um, the, the widest audience possible to increase awareness. Um, luckily, we have some, some opportunities coming up um, pretty soon with the awareness month in March and other hopeful also um, uh, engaging activities, uh, you know, where you have lady walk, where you donate um, uh, some, some funding based on uh, physical activity, for example. So we have uh, many, many great things going up, coming up there. And uh, luckily we are also uh, partnering up here in the project with um, Adrian, uh, who's also present tonight, uh, and this Hungarian Patient Association, they're doing a great job. So really happy with this whole consortium. And um, it's, it's uh, an invitation to you to help to spread the word. We are really uh, trying, we're trying to be active on um, at social media and, and of course on the project website, which is um, under development, but um, going to be relaunched soon. Um, and uh, yeah, just we have these 10 work packages. This is basically the female project uh, translated into a Gantt chart. Uh, it looks... Uh, kind of messy, but still, you know, it's, it's structured. Um, so translate it into all deliverables and milestones in the project, uh, you could visualize it this way. So it's like now we are one year in, into the project and we still have many deliverables to come, but it's, it's a lot of um, interesting work together, how to pull this off. Um, so we have some, uh, some great uh, tools to help us uh, uh, keep enthusiasm and progress in this uh, uh, interdisciplinary project. So this half double methodology is is securing that we are we are really uh, measuring uh, the impact um, throughout the, the the whole project, um, and that we are guided by stakeholder satisfaction. Uh, we really try to establish a flow in our projects to keep a rhythm rhythm in uh, each of the work packages and across the work packages, and we're really trying to act a collaborative leadership where um, the partners uh, hope I hopefully um, I feel that um, they, they are um, that we are we are trying at, at, at project ownership level to really uh, remove the stones on the road um, to really uh, assist them in, in proceeding so um, I mean we're really trying to to make this difficult task uh, 
uh, real, realized. Um, and just to share with you a group photo from the Danish team here, uh, you know some of these already. Um, so uh, this is a, a, nice, uh, a nice project to be involved with. Um, we have uh, epidemiologists and geneticists and psychologists and surgeons and myself coming from humanities. Um, it's a, it's a, such an, a, a joy to be part of this, this interesting project. Um, and uh, luckily also we actually engage some, some policymakers already. Um, like you see here on the LinkedIn post, uh, we, we actually have a member of Danish parliament to, to interact with us. So we're really uh, trying to put it out there. So uh, yeah, again, feel free to interact and uh, uh, follow us on, on LinkedIn and Twitter and Instagram. And um, yeah, looking forward to your questions later on. Um, that's it for me for now. Thank you so much, Ulrich. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, yeah, that's very impressive. I, I think we, we just uh, continue. And then, as I said, we are going to discuss all the questions at the end, if, if you are fine with that. Um, I think that there will be some questions on, on how we can uh, support this project, um, what we can do. And um, I, I think that's important that we address this um, at the end. So <clears throat> Attila, please continue uh, with the Lucy app. So good evening, everyone. Thank you. And thank you, Uri, for your nice in introduction. And I would also like to thank to the EEL for the opportunity to share uh, with you our concept of uh, patient profiling and, and big data collection by using the Lucy app. As you know, the, one of the major problems with endometriosis is, uh, is the lack of non-invasive diagnosis. Uh, for patients uh, with the neg negative imaging, we still have to do a laparoscopic surgery uh, according to the latest ESHA guidelines. And, um, and for me, this is really unacceptable. This also yields for a very long diagnostic delay, which can be as long as 10 years. So um, I think we really, really have to do something. And, and uh, this is also very costly. As you see here, we've spent three times more money on a patient with endometriosis when compared to a patient with, without this disease. But we know that the natural history of, of endometriosis is unknown, unfortunately, and uh, there is um, um, compelling evidence uh, suggesting that there are critical windows of exposures that you see on this, on this chart. According to Queen Azonduan and Christian Becker's uh, work, there are new possible risk factor, risk factors which might play a role in the pathogenesis. Is like sun sensitivity, dysplastic navy, consumption of red meat and trans fats, and uh, maybe some uh, pollutants like uh, endocrine disrupting chemicals. Um, this, these uh, risk factors will be investigated uh, in, in our project. As Ulrich already mentioned, one of the outcomes of, of the female project will be the mobile app, the Lucy, for women living with endometriosis. This instrument will be used for data collection. The gathered, hopefully big data will then be assessed uh, at the Technical University of Stockholm at KTH using machine learning techniques. The other purpose of this app is to increase the health literacy among our patients living with, with endometriosis. For me, as a gynecologist, the definition of big data is, is, is not very clear, I have to tell you. After several meetings with, with Professor uh, Svatja Meyer at KTH, at, in, the guys from Stockholm, I still have some doubts, but uh, this is a very, on this, on this uh, picture, you have a very easy and very simplified manner. How can we, how can we, um, uh, talk about big data. So 
from multiple sources, either from people or machines, uh, we can generate a big, big amount of, of data very quickly. This data then, then is gathered and analyzed in order to gain some new insights. In our field, in healthcare, uh, mostly for better diagnosis and uh, more successful treatment options. And this also applies to the Lucy app. The question is whether are we able to collect from our cohort of, of approximately 10,000 patients from collaborating centers uh, millions of data during the study period? And this is, I think, one of the, one of the biggest questions. If we look at this recently published chart from JAMA, you can see that the basic medical knowledge, which is called here like clinical wisdom, is dealing with thousands or ten thousands of, of data. But if you want to administer classic machine learning or deep learning, as it's done here, we need millions of, of or, or billions of, of data entries. Um, and in this very recently published article from Vancouver, Canada, uh, these uh, scientists were, were using um, machine learning to study the chronic pelvic pain and the use of machine learning uh, in the study of uh, chronic, pelvic, chronic pelvic pain. And as you see on this diagram, it was a very strong correlation uh, found between the endometriosis health profile 30 and the pain catastrophizing scale in order to, to assess chronic pelvic pain. And also endometriosis related symptoms uh, had a very good color correlation with, with um, chronic pelvic pain when they were assessed by machine learning. Professor Bourdel has published a fundamental article on the comparison of different available questionnaires on endometriosis. And based on his work and novel data, we have um, uh, also designed a new longitudinal questionnaire for the Lucy, as you will see later on, in order to assess the quality of life of our patients. This is also a very interesting recent article published by Italian authors that assesses the geographic distribution of endometriosis within an Italian region. As we see on the chart, the southeast part, the most industrialized part of this, this um, Friuli Venezia Giulia region, we see a uh, highest percentage of patients living with endometriosis, whereas if you look at the less polluted northern northern western part, this is almost free from patients with endometriosis. So we believe that by assessing the spatial patterns of our Lucy app users, uh, we will be able to gain an insight to geographic distribution of disease uh, in these uh, collaborating countries. This is again a very interesting new article from Anamic Knapp's group from, from the Netherlands. As, as you know, we are all aware of inconsistent data regarding the, the effect of, of diet on endometriosis. And uh, in this recent article, however, the, um, our colleagues, they did not find any statistically significant uh, difference of, of using any specific diet with regards of quality of life in endometriosis. But uh, these patients living with endometriosis, and uh, they had a feeling that uh, dietary adjustment have a beneficial effect on the quality of life. As you see here, the removal of different um, ingredients like gluten, diary products, or sugar, uh, decrease the, the EHP3 scores. Even the limitation of these products was also helpful in this cohort of women. So we also uh, designed a lifestyle module in, in our app. It will have a dietary and physical activity module uh, to assess the 
the diet and exercise of, of uh, the users. This is a valid idea, I think, regarding the patient profiling and design. According to um, Dr. Bertel Meshko, patient design means to involve patients on highest level of decision making. You can possibly think that you can develop anything for patients without actively involving them in the process. Indeed, we plan to collect patient shared data um, by using the, the Lucy app to increase both health literacy and also patient empowerment. So these are the two main objectives regarding the Lucy. In work package three, as already already told, we aim to estimate the prevalence of and the geogra geographical distribution of endometriosis like symptoms in Denmark, Hungary, and Scotland. And in the big data, the, the work package five, we would like to recognize patterns of quality of life, lifestyle, and environmental factors related with endometriosis using this application. We also would like to generate patients' profiles and structured clinical data. For the quality of life questionnaires, we, we plan to use the endometriosis health, health profile 30 and also the central sensitization inventory, which is a relatively new instrument to assess central uh, sensitization. And uh, let me finally introduce you to this, this app, which is in fact a next generation mobile menstruation calendar. But beyond of, beyond of that, it has a very clean user interface based on user interviews. Uh, uh, it's a symptom input system based on, on medical interviews, preventive notification of possible gynecological diseases, and obviously offers a completely anonymous data handling. This is how it looks like. Looks like I think it's very, very nice. And this would be um, um, an, a user journey in, in Lucy. So firstly, our patients will record the, their symptoms on a daily basis. Then Lucy will detect the symptom patterns typical to endometriosis. Then there is a notification to the user uh, with the link to the knowledge base. In an ideal scenario, patients, our patients will go to see her a gynecologist. Then uh, the patient records endometriosis as a diagnosis in Lucy. And the user data can now analyze for, for further patterns. At the moment, we have more than 4,000 uh, active users in a month in Hungary. The average usage minute uh, time is only two minutes per day. I don't know whether is it okay or too, too, too short. Uh, we will discuss this later. We have uh, more than 100,000 symptoms recorded a year and more than 100 medical diagnoses recorded so far. As I have already mentioned, we have a validated pain scale and visual data feedbacks uh, incorporated. Also, knowledge base, medical content about endometriosis. And what, what is the most important for, for our project is the research content. There is an integrated questionnaire engine. We will have our baseline questionnaire which is uh, been produced um, in the work package three and our longitudinal questionnaire, which uh, also has already been um, uh, designed. So we have two questionnaires to, to assess our patients, multiple questions type, question types, like including uh, single multiple choices and numeric scale, free text and multiple text field are available. New questionnaires can be added remotely to the app anytime. So as you see, it's a very easy to use, very simple surface. And I think this will increase the, the, 
the compliance of our patients, hopefully. Regarding the longitudinal questionnaire, uh, we have the validated questionnaires I have already mentioned. We will assess the endometriosis symptoms, the new pot potential risk factors, and the big data will be analyzed at, at the Technical University of Stockholm. The, the Lucy app is ready to use in Hungarian and English at the moment, but there are ongoing uh, translate, translations to Danish, Swedish, uh, German, and French. And obviously, there is a possibility of free text input in Lucy. Regarding wider implications, we, we will validate our results on both a future validation set and the geographical geographical validation set as well from collaborating uh, countries, thereby emulating real world performance. We hope to uncover previously unreported risk factors of, of this enigmatic disease. So we have a number of collaborating centers at the moment, Aarhus University, uh, Scottish universities, uh, also technical universities from Stockholm and Riga, endometriosis centers from Vienna and Bordeaux, Duisburg and Clermont-Ferrand is on the way. And we also looking forward to welcome anybody who wants to join us. Thank you very much for your attention and please do not forget to join us in Bordeaux next year in June. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks, Attila, for your presentation. Yeah, this is so interesting, and I, I have some questions already, and uh, I, I'm sure that we are going to discuss th some important points. Um, yes, we we need to we need, really need to use the Lucy app here too. I think it, German translation would be wonderful, um, and uh, hopefully it will be available very soon. Um, Nicola. Now it's your turn, last but not least. Thank you, Aaron. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, I will try to keep on time. And uh, um, I must say, uh, I don't know if it's really a conflict of interest because uh, in the female project, uh, that's how European commissions uh, see actually how they can support research. So there's an involvement of a private company, a university center, hospital. So that's how we can get some this kind of huge financial support with the, the good mix of uh, the, good, the good advantage of a, a private company and the good advantage of university and hospital. So today I'm, I'm really more on the side of Shargar company, which is a, a startup I co-founded two years ago. And it's dedicated to augmented reality and learning to help surgeon. And, and historically it's, it's, an, it's a spin-off of our uh, public lab. I worked uh, during 11 years uh, with this professor Batley uh, on, on machine learning and specifically more uh, really dedicated to, uh, to surgery. Just basically how it works, augmented reality, um, because that has an implication for endometriosis. Uh, and that's our um, background. So basically we take the uh, um, MRI or the CT scan, we will be the 3D model of the organs. And then we will fuse it with a 2D vision in real time during surgery. So you have the 3D model, uh, there's artificial intelligence to build this 3D models. And, and the objective, and that's going to be the next step is also to be the 3D model with endometriosis, but whatever. Simply for this uh, patient with uh, myomas, but we already published also data on adenomyosis. We will do the fusion in between the 3D preoperative model and the 2D perioperative model. And that's what I have on my screen when I use augmented reality. So you can see the tumor inside the organ. So it's like you are guided for your surgery. So it, it's a very um, first step, but we uh, develop also solution for liver surgery or 
um, partial nephrectomy, which really guides a surgeon during the, the, the resection of tumors. And the point is, if we want to move ahead, if we want to move forward, we need really more uh, data from the surgeon themselves. So really need massive data collection from European surgeon mainly, because this is a European funded um, uh, project. And then we will apply a deep learning, just two examples. So for example, that's just for the recognition of the uterus. Sounds simple, but that's already a, a huge work. So you can see the algorithm that recognizes automatically the uterus with 400 image. And then you can see the one with 4,000 image. So you can see the precision of the algorithm. So this is again basic, but what we want to move is from the detection of simple organs to the detection of endometriosis and to the detection of division plane. So we'll see the implication, the possible implication for endometriosis. Another example is for bleeding detection. It looks like more uh, endometriosis. So you see uh, how we build algorithm. We ask the surgeon to point out what we call segmentation on uh, surgical images to point the active bleeding versus non-active bleeding. So the red and the yellow part, for example. And then we put it in the machine to get some machine learning and train the machine to recognize automatically the bleeding. And that's what it, it does at the end. So you will see in pink or red, um, really the first, uh, the very first step of the bleeding. So it's like your automatic car. It detects bleeding before even the, the, the brain of, surgeon, of the surgeon realize there's a bleeding. That's what we want to do in animatrosis also, detecting uh, in real time the lesion and the division plate. So that's very ambitious, but that's what we want to do uh, with the uh, female project. So practically, what we want to build is an algorithm for automatic detection of the endometriotic lesion. You may know that in the literature, even for this surgical um, classification, and I saw uh, Dan Martin is with us and he worked extensively on the description of this lesion. But finally, we have to be back to this kind of basic. I mean, try to be able to recognize and classify and standardize this uh, recognition of the uh, lesion. And then also, what uh, we want to do is also to try to find an agreement where to do your incision during surgery. You may know that it's mainly uh, really hard to acquire for a surgeon to do the anamaturetic uh, surgery. So we want really to get the knowledge of expert surgeon and not only expert, but from junior surgeon also really to keep this, to, to get this knowledge and then to be able to reproduce it by machine learning in real time. And that's really the objective of, of the project. So basically how we, we will proceed is we have actually, we work with two center, but that will be also other uh, hospital center. We gonna, we, we are recording all the surgery. Then we do anonymization of a surgery. And then we have, uh, some uh, people that will work on segmentation, really try to teach the computer where are the lesions and when are the division plane. So that's an, an example of tools we built for the project. So we need to anonymize uh, the, the video. That's for the, the information of the patient. And of course, you want to get the consent of the affirmation. So you see here on the left, you see you, you recognize uh, someone on the video. And what we build for the project, it's a machine learning automatic dish, um, identification of the seconds that could help to identify the, the, the patient. So that's how we can get the proof. So you see, outside is on, on the right, there's, it, it's a black screen. So it's like removing all the secrets. So that's really how we warranty that we respect the anonymization of the patient. And then we can work really on clear and clean data, uh, respecting the, um, the anonymization of the patient. And then what we will for the project is some artificial intelligence tools to help the surgeon and wh whatever is the level 
to do the segmentation. So that's for bleeding. But you, you see on the left how long it takes to, to teach the, the computer. You have to point every point of, of the limitation of, the, of uh, the bleeding. And then we build artificial intelligence tool to automatic, automatically do this segmentation. That means you have artificial intelligence also to teach the machine learning algorithm um, uh, to recognize endometriosis or, or bleeding. And that's how we really build the workflow of how we will get um, the really one part of, of the knowledge and the expertise and try to standardize this uh, expertise. So you can see basically how we are classify uh, we classify the um, superficial lesion or deep lesion of endometriosis. That's really, again, the first step that how we can teach the computer to recognize and to classify uh, without any sub subjective aspect, really getting an objective classification of um, the endometriosis, uh, at least the uh, theoretical exploration, and uh, then the division pain. So I just uh, get this uh, image, I think, uh, um, Attila, you just share it on, on uh, LinkedIn. So it's just to show you the huge difference in not all it's for policies in, in the fertility treatment all over the world. But you can really imagine that there is a huge difference um, in terms of quality of care and quality of surgical procedure and even quality of classification uh, all even all over Europe. So the objective is really standardization for classification Standardization, standardization of surgical procedure, at least one part of the surgical procedure. I know it's very ambitious, but that's really um, the first step of this uh, machine learning stand, uh, standardization. And of course, it's at the end offers the same quality of surgery from Oslo to Istanbul and even to Delhi. And again, this is very ambitious, but this is really the first step on the way to uh, get standardization and to offer the best quality of care we can uh, to, um, to uh, our patient. And then the machine learning will do that, that really what I show you on the screen, like recognizing deep endometriosis and showing that you should do the incision at one part or another uh, on this uh, type of, uh, of lesion. So in fact, as you saw, we need a lot of data that's really, uh, has um, Attila told you, that's really the main point. I mean, getting more and more data that we can really build a stable and really able uh, machine learning algorithm. And then having um, some partner surgeon, whatever is the level of, of those surgeon, to do the segmentation, that's a huge work. But we are really in, and that's the advantage of of some part of the private company is really getting industrialization of this segmentation, meaning we can offer every kind of partner uh, the tools to do the annotation and the data to set to work on and to try to build this uh, machine learning algorithm. Thank you. And, and please write, uh, send me an email if you want to be part of, of, of the project on, on this uh, surgical uh, aspect. You will, you're going to be more than welcome. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I think this, that was really very interesting um, tonight. Very interesting session. Uh, very visionary. Um, all three presentations. And... Um, I would like to start uh, with a question and um, you, you might all answer it. Um, and it's about the diagnosis of the disease. Um, I think one of the one of the very important points is that still <coughs> diagnosis of the disease are missed. And uh, Attila, you said that one step in the Lucy app in the process is that the patient with a certain profile goes to see a gynecologist. And the question is, what happens if this gynecologist does not diagnose endometriosis? And um, in, in, in terms of surgery, um, Nicola, what, what would you say is um, 
the right way to diagnose the disease would mean that all patients need to have an MRI or uh, can this diagnosis be done by ultrasound? And uh, what, what is the standardization of this process? I think that's a very important point and, and I would like to know your opinion on that. All right, I think you, you're fully, fully right. So I think one of the major problems is that for a definitive diagnosis, our patients has to see at least, or in the average, four gynecologists, which is, I think, a huge number. Not to mention the, the huge diagnostic delay, uh, which is years. But, um, but we also aim to, to improve the health literacy of our patients. So they will be more informed and they will be able to, to, to if they are not satisfied with the gynecology, they, they will look for, for a specialist who's, who's really, um, really um, able to, 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 to help her and seek a, a, a good quality um, of, of medical, medical treatment. So I think, yeah, it's a, it's a very good question. I, I don't know the answer yet, but with, by using the Lucy, I think we, we can reduce this, this uh, very long time of, of the diagnostic delay, which is, which is now it's unacceptable. Um, I can give you my, my point of view also. Um, what we realized at the, at the beginning of the project and what we realize now is even when you ask uh, what you think is uh, not really junior, but uh, after the residency of, of, uh, of uh, our um, resident, that they are really not, uh, they have not the same vision of, of what are the limits of uh, superficial endometriosis. So where you should start your incision, which is really a huge, huge, huge problem. That means one part, we are not able really to teach them in a good way and how to find a consensus. So this is the same thing for probably um, diagnosis using MRI or, or, or a clinical evaluation. But when, when you do machine learning, you point out all the way you teach uh, your students and all your way you teach the machine. So you have to be back to the basic. How has the surgeon I really proceed to choose where I'm, I'm going to start my incision, for example. So again, as you have to teach to a kid, uh, because the level of the, the machine learning of algorithm are really basic, actually. Uh, but what we, are to what we have to focus on is really the quality of data we will use for the algorithm. In two years, the, the machine learning algorithm will be really more, more, more powerful than what we have actually. So really the key one is getting the right data, the right amount of data and the perfect quality of the data, which means having the grand two for uh, diagnosis is it's not so easy uh, to get. Do we have to use MRI? Do the clinical evaluation is sufficient? That's really, do we have to use Astrology and surgical exploration. Quite hard to say. Thank you. Um, there has been a question by Professor Schwepper, I think. Is that right? No, uh, I have no direct question, but if you ask me, uh, from my uh, point of view, it's very interesting. Mm, the rate of wrong positive and wrong negative findings on MI. You see, it's, uh, it's very simple on ovarian endometriosis, but uh, if it comes to peritoneal endometriosis, the diagnostic tools are limited and we are back to the old fashioned laparoscopy and proof with histology. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. You agree? <laughs> I mean, we are about to, to 
Um, are there any other questions from the <clears throat> from the audience? There's some noise problem. I'm not sure whether it's my laptop here. Um, I'm sorry for that. Um, well, um, Ulrich, what does all this mean for uh, the future of centralization of endometriosis care? Does this mean that we all need a Danish system with uh, a, a, a very small number of very high level uh, centers or, or what would that mean? Because when we put all this together, um, as I can see, we need a, a whole package of expertise in one center. And this is something that many of the smaller hospitals and, and units cannot offer. So yeah, thank you, Hal. In this way. Yeah, I, I think I got the, the, the question. So actually, in some cases, this is actually where we are in Denmark. I mean, even being a tiny country with many resources, we, we have a, a lack of doctors, for example. So, and, and, and the, um, uh, the, the, the increasing uh, complexity of multimorbidity out in the primary care sector, et cetera, will, will really put a huge pressure on the entire Danish healthcare system in the future. Uh, we are actually now also uh, not only fighting COVID, but actually also there has been a strike from nurses so the, the the system is really under pressure and i'm i'm personally convinced that you know if we are not applying some technical tools to assist the human in this system it doesn't work the, the, there will not be a well functioning healthcare system in the future does that mean that it'll be centralized well maybe the knowledge will be centralized but it will be applied in local context and as long as uh, we're using technology to clinical intelligence, uh, so it's not necessarily only AI, where it's artificial intelligence, it's also IA, it's like in intelligent augmentation. I think that's, that, then, we are, then we are talking something interesting. So, uh, so yeah, I, I think we need to centralize knowledge and evidence, but we need to, to implement it locally in a secure and trustful way. And, I, I, I personally believe technology holds a huge place there, but we need to develop then the responsible innovation, the responsible tools. And we need to do this across public and private partners because they cannot do it themselves. Yes, thank you. I, I absolutely agree. Uh, we just uh, discussed um, yesterday uh, about a new pathologist for our hospital and uh, uh, there was one applicant, he presented his vision and it was all about uh, digital pathology <laughs> because he said, yeah, we, we are not going to have pathologists in the future, so we need uh, to di digitalize everything. And, and I think that's what, uh, yeah, that's absolutely true. Yes. Um, are there any other questions? Yes, Alim. Uh, yes, you, you, my, my question was yes. how could the doctors uh, uh, from endometriosis centers or hospitals uh, contribute to this project? Uh, for the surgical part, um, the, the more that we have, the, the best it is, that's for sure. So this is a, pro a legal issue. And uh, of course, there's many points about how we can share the knowledge uh, how we can build something that uh, the, the, the objective is really to be also to commercial, commercialize uh, some, uh, a product for sure. Uh, but I mean, this is a common project also for the, the, the quality uh, uh, of care. So that's one part of the, the data. And I think Attila has the same uh, issue. Um, and one part is, is really enrichment of the data, which means segmentation again to show the, the computer so you can be involved in, in this two part of of the project uh, whatever you want uh, you can have, like say you i'm going to spend 30 minutes 15 minutes per week for the project and be involved in the publication or you want to spend half a day and there's many other co co collaboration we can imagine Alin, from, from our side, it's very easy. You just write an email that you're interested 
and we just adapt the, the ethics accordingly and you can just join us anytime. So I think the this app will be available in German very soon and uh, you're more than welcome. Okay, thank you. It wasn't just a question for me, it was for all the participants. Uh... <laughs> Obviously, for everyone. <laughs> Yeah, so I would like to thank everybody. <clears throat> um, I think it, it, it was a good discussion, small group, but intense uh, discussion. We will all take this information and uh, bring it to our groups. And uh, yes, I, I would be very happy if we could continue in person in June in Bordeaux, because uh, uh, I think probably meeting in person, uh, June will be hopefully the best. Uh, as we are all really hungry for personal meetings I, I, and very well visited and, and I'm really looking forward to, to see you all there. So thank you for tonight. Very interesting project and uh, yes, we will keep on and, and I wish you all a happy Christmas and a very good and healthy new year. Thank you so much. Good night happy to everybody. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thank bye -bye. you. Thank you very much. Take care. Bye bye. Bye. Bye bye. Bye bye.